welcome to today's broadcast of North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of NIC television students and your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist Tony Stewart. We're most fortunate to have as our guest today Mr. Ron Terrio, who is the director of the Native American program at Salish Kootenai College uh, in the state of Montana. Our guest has lectured all across the United States, including such institutions as Harvard, Yale, and Berkeley, and a number of other Amer leading American universities. He's been with us on campus today, and I can testify to the fact that he has given just a wonderful address to the student body at North Idaho College, and we've invited him on this program to talk about the problems of stereotyping of the American Native, and particularly what's happened in relation to history textbooks. Uh, Mr. Terrio, it's just a great pleasure to welcome you to our program. I look forward to this interview. Thank you. And I'm very happy to have on the panel today regular panelists, uh, Janelle Burke, who is an attorney uh, in the state of Idaho. And next to her is Richard Snyder, who's been on the program a number of times before. And he's a member of the faculty of North Idaho College in the Department of Anthropology. And I would invite Janelle Burke to commence the questioning. Mr. Terrio, for the benefit of our viewing audience, can you give us some background about yourself? Where were you born? What tribe are you a member of? <coughs> yes, I was, I was born in Stockton, California. And I was brought back to the reservation at a very early I, uh, age. Uh, I'm a member of the Salish Kootenai tribes. I'm also Salish Kootenai, but also Kalispell. As with many people, there's a mixture of tribes involved there. And I stayed on the reservation until about five years old. And then I was uh, taken back down to California. And I was pretty well raised in California, Central Valley area, until I uh, entered the service in uh, 1949. Were you always interested in the Native American studies, or was that something that developed as you grew older? Well, I guess it developed as I grew older because uh, I was always Indian. I knew that, but I didn't know what an Indian was. And uh, when I started to find out, through the benefit of the elders uh, passing to me, I started to realize that uh, who I was and that there was a connection with that as to what was happening to me in my life. Uh, then it became uh, more of a course to follow because I started to realize that if I have a problem don't understand that much about myself and uh, because of what was happening around me, the conditioning as we were speaking of earlier, if I don't understand that then there's a lot of other Indian people don't understand it. And so that sort of triggered my interest uh, towards especially the educational academic portions of, of pursuing Native American studies. And at what point did you then become a director of Native American Studies? Well, actually, I joined the, uh, returned to the reservation in 1979, and I accepted a job as a grant writer for the college that was just starting at that time. And I found out that uh, no human being should be a grant writer, so I decided to change over, and I started to be a teacher. And I started at that point to develop the Native American Studies program that we have at the college. Uh, that's basically uh, eight years ago. And of course, we've changed and modified as we've learned lessons through the years. Do you live on the reservation? Do you have a connection with the reservation at this point in time? Oh, yes, very much so. I, I live on a reservation just below St. Ignatius up against the Mission Mountains, which is one of the few, the only tribal wilderness area in existence at least uh, in this part of the country. And uh, it's a beautiful place to live. Richard Snyder. Ron, I was raised with cowboy and Indian movies, and John Wayne, and all the good, everything, Hop Along, Cassidy, the whole bunch. Um, was there ever an Indian as depicted in the movies? Does that Indian live today? Not that I can ever think of. You know, the one always comes to my mind is Otano and Kimosabi. Mm -hmm. And I think they finally found out what Kimosabi meant and they quit using it. But <laughs> the, that was one of the whole concepts we worked with is that there was never really a, well, there was a positive image of an Indian, last of the Mohicans. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one that comes to my mind as a positive, but they killed him off in the end. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the problems we see is that having a positive image appear any place. Uh, they were hard to find. So you would say that Indians have trouble with a, with a positive image in their lives, perhaps even in the late 1980s? Well, I think it happens any place, you know, and I can relate to my own situation. 
Uh, my conditioning and the conditioning of other people often comes from the media. Well, the same movies that everyone else is watching, the cowboy and Indians, the drunk Indian, you know, you never saw an Indian ride into a bar on a horse and shoot up the place, but you always saw a horseman or a cowboy step over a drunk Indian outside. Well, that's that kind of conditioning. I see the same movies. So if I'm being conditioned that way, I'm being told, even through the media, what's expected of me. And if there's nothing to counter that, then you're leaving an open door for people start to start accepting the stereotype. What about on the reservation, say the, the Flathead Reservation? And you're, you're saying that uh, you're being influenced by stereotyping on television, radio, motion pictures. Isn't there something on the reservation that, that, that counters that? Definitely. One of the things that counters it <coughs> right now is a resurgence of the cultural values, and that's done through cultural committees that exist because the cultural committees now teach what the families used to teach. Because we have so many dysfunctional families, we find that we have to now turn to sort of an organization. What we're hoping is that we teach young people about their culture, and then maybe the next generation will be taught by their own families about the culture. The other thing is we have a lot of things that we, we push an effort to counter the stereotyping now. Within the college, we have a uh, public broadcasting system, a, a television station that's now starting to operate. Uh, and we have two channels that we set out within just the valley. But by putting out the same information in school, putting it out over TV, we feel that it'll touch more people. Education is one of the most positive things that we have to use as a weapon right now. And, and wouldn't seeing it on television uh, have an equal effect with seeing the other stereotyping on television. I think it was Marshall McLuhan that said the, the medium is the message. And if you're going to see the stereotyping on television, you should see the positive through the same medium to have, you know, sort of the same effect. True, for whatever reason it is, if it's on television, it's validated. Mm -hmm. And the same way if it's in writing, if someone puts it in print, you know, there's enough people that they wouldn't look no further than the back side of that print. That's the law. I mean, that's, that's the whole fact. So that's why it also can be dangerous. But if we do it in a positive sense, then we simply validate the information that we want to put out. Ron, let's talk about uh, some of the things that you've done that I was so impressed with. You've got a really excellent background in dealing with education and curricula. And one of the great problems in this country has been uh, the writing of textbooks for our history. Would you take some time to tell us about uh, a two-part uh, question? One is, what all do we find still in textbooks that are so wrong and, and, and establish and continue to support those stereotypes? And two, why is it so slow to get those uh, books changed by educators who are supposed to be informed? Okay, I'd love to, as long as considering my age and my memory goes now and then, we might have to ask you about the second question again. Sure. But the first point out, the stereotyping that oftentimes we, we see, the stereotyping that I'm talking about, is that often the Indians always uh, perceived as back in that time of 1850 to 1880. I mean, no matter how it's talked about history, sure, that we're talking about history, but you're hard pressed in a history book, even if it's talking about history from 1901 forward, to see anything about the Indian existing. And because they failed to do that, that Indians do exist now, and they are part of uh, either in social science, economics, where it is, the Indians there, or government, and they definitely impact government, especially within the states. And yet you can't find anything about the, what you find is the ancient, or you know, not so much ancient even, but it, we're sort of artifacts. And we'd like to sort of get off the shelf and be in this present day, but you can't find that in the uh, textbooks that we deal with. And in relation to that, uh, why is it so difficult to change? Why, uh, this, this is common knowledge and it, there's been so much talked about uh, in recent years that uh, there are these problems, but it seems like the State Department of Education and, and curriculum committees don't deal with it. Well, I, I think a lot of it is because uh, those people are also conditioned. And I think many people are very comfortable 
if the Indian is kept as an artifact uh, because they don't want to face the reality that he does exist today, that he is making successes, and uh, we're also making some pretty good failures too. I mean, you know, it's just the human animal. But there is something else happening with the Indian, and I think a lot of people prefer the Indian to be ancient. Oftentimes when you talk to people, even in a political nature, and they start talking about treaties, one of the first arguments you get back on a treaty is, well, it's so old, you know. And of course the counter is, oh, well, it's not as old as your constitution. You know, so if it's old, and Monroe Doctrine, you know, when old Kennedy used Monroe Doctrine to protect us on the deal with Cuba, no one complained about it being old. And yet, when you talk treaty, that's old. Because the Indian is perceived in so many people's minds, including educators, as being past tense, rather than now, present time. Thank you. Janelle Burke. Let's talk about some of the stereotypes, and perhaps you can set us straight and give us the right facts. What about the stereotype that Indians drink a lot? Is that true? Or do they drink more? Or is there a, is there a greater it's, yeah. difficulty <laughs> when they do? <coughs> it's a shame I got to sit in this chair, because you could do a lot better with stereotyping if you're on your feet. But yeah, we have the problem with alcoholism. And Indians do drink a lot. If you look back to the, or the original drinking system, a lot of the Indians were brown bag drinkers because it was illegal for the Indian to drink. So when you started, you had it in a brown bag and you guzzled it as quick as you could. Well, if you drank that much whiskey that fast, you'd end up a drunk too. It's that simple. But what happens, there's a lot of other things that play into it. Uh, and I'm not making alibis now for the people. It's just some of the facts of history that count into it. Uh, you take the likes of uh, what was the the position of the man in the society before the reservation. He was a hunter, he was a gatherer, not that much. Women usually did the gathering. But he was also a ceremonies person to balance the ceremonies, okay? So the world stayed balanced. But with the reservation, with the change of the culture and the assimilation process, he no longer was a hunter or the warrior, or his ceremonies were even under attack. So when he had nothing else to do, how did he balance his life? Well, usually they didn't. They turned to something to kill pain. People can say what they want. When you're scorched out of your gourd, you do not feel pain. And if you sober up, you do. So the idea is don't ever sober up. Well, through a long time of only conditioning, because it goes family to family. You know, if you live in a family and your father is a drunk and your mother's a drunk and your social life centers around the bar, the good chance you're going to have the same type of social life. It's set up. What has had to happen was the problem, nothing ever stopped or controlled the problem, or even recognized it, because everyone expected an Indian to be a drunk anyway. So no one was really surprised. As a tribe and as a people, we're realizing now, there are all kinds of efforts on the reservation to turn this around. Hopefully, and I see it happening, uh, I can see the change, at least on the Flathead Reservation, there is definitely a change in the attitude of the people and there's a sobriety is in mode that, that's the way to go now what about the young people the young people that you have in classes and so forth are they uh, conscious of this problem and do they have a desire to change oh most assuredly they're conscious of it because I doubt if there is a child on that reservation that is not touched in some way within the family by the drinking problem uh, it's not that everyone's a drunk now. That's something that has slackened down because of people assuming responsibilities for their own actions. But I think every student I have, they have either seen the, the heartache or the disaster or whatever's taken place because of alcohol, and they're very aware of it. Also, they're becoming, um, through the educational system, they're becoming uh, more responsible for their own actions and, and starting to say, you know, it's okay not to be a drunk. Self-image, I'm sure, has a lot to do with how one perceives themselves. Uh, themselves. Another um, uh, stereotype, uh, Indians don't work. Uh, they uh, they um, collect their government check on a regular basis and they don't work. Is that true? That one always drives me up the wall because I, I could sit here and probably say a thousand times, look at we do not get a monthly check and people will not believe that because that same condition, that concept, all Indians, you know, you get a monthly check and you're on welfare. Well, in some cases, I think you'd find that uh, 
That's not true, first of all. Yeah, cer certain tribes, if they have developed their economy well enough, pay per capita to their people because they're organized as corporations and then the people have a right to a certain amount. And we do on our reservation pay a per capita payment. But that happens only as we're successful. If we're not successful, there's no money to go to the people and they know that. So it has to be a joint effort to be successful. The, uh, by golly, what was the rest of the question? Are a lot of Indian people now working and what kinds of oh, jobs yeah. are they doing? Out, and outside the reservation as well as on the reservation. Yeah, well you figure on our tribe that half our people, about 3,400 of our people live off the reservation and they work and they maintain themselves in the outside community. Uh, on the reservation, we probably have about a 48% employment unemployment rate. However, that if you're gauging that as working year round, no, that's what we have. But uh, a lot of Indian people still use the wood forest industry and they work seasonal. And they'll work hard for three or four months and then they'll coast. And, but they make enough to meet their needs. Uh, it's odd and I've always thought it interesting that on our reservation we have a commodities program where they give you food each month. Well, there's some 1,500 families receive commodities on our reservation. Only 600 of those are Indian families. The rest are non-Indian families. So, you know, the Indian in the sense of the, the giveaway programs is probably balanced. Considering the ratio of populations, maybe he's ahead. But the same programs, and I, my own personal point of view, are they're destructive. Anytime a dependency is set up, it's destructive. And that's why we're trying to move past that in our economic uh, efforts on the reservation. And are Indians becoming educated in greater numbers than ever before? Is that what the facts and, and trends would show? Sure. And it happens for a simple reason. 20 years ago, I went back to the reservation. Had I gone back to the reservation, I would have never been elected to the tribal council because I had a degree. Educators were suspect because education, the federal Indian policy of education was used to destroy the culture. The elders didn't want to touch you with a 10-foot pole. The fact that it's changed when I was, I was put on the council in 84 and uh, became the tribal chairman in 86. But during that period of time, there was a definite change in the attitude on education. And what we've seen is for the Indian that education can be used as a positive force for self-identification, for uh, learning the truth of history, learning the truth of what, it, uh, what this world's all about. And it's not totally a negative force, but it was suspect, so it was hard to come around. Now, there's 21 tribal colleges throughout the United States. <coughs> all of them are impacting the tribes. Education is becoming the way to go. Richard Snyder. I was thinking about the concept of stereotyping Indians, and it seems to me the greatest stereotype of all is that there is an Indian, and that all Indians have a great white spirit called Wakan Tonka, and they all say wash tay a lot, and wear feathers, right. and my understanding is that about the time Columbus arrived, there were over 2,000 distinct languages in North, Central, and South America, and that would imply a tremendous amount of diversity, yes. and, and not an Indian. Uh, what kind of diversity is there among Indians today? You were saying you, you, there, there's at least three different tribal heritages in your heritage. Mm -hmm. Do these people get along? Do they socialize with each other? Are they able to cooperate? Uh, what about the stereotype? Yeah, it, uh, the stereotype, you know, and that, th that is a problem because all Indian tribes are different. And even within our own grouping, the Kootenai have a different way of spirituality than the Salish have a spirituality, than the Kalispell or the Ponderé have a spirituality. All of it varies. The problem that through this conditioning we talked about, the stereotype and the education, you ask anyone, you know, how many Indians you know about? Well, they know about Navajos, they know about Sioux, they know about Apaches, and they know about Cherokees. But that just automatically cuts out the hundreds of other tribes that existed and everyone different. But, uh, you know, if that's the main point, you know, everyone wears a headdress. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't happen. 
you know, big fancy stand-up one like that. But that's because of the somehow not recognizing the existence, even then and now, of that vast variety of tribes that existed. Does that have any influence on pan-Indianism, the idea of, of Indians getting together to, to deal with common problems? Are, are, there, are there problems within that, well, the Northern Cheyenne don't want to cooperate with the Crow because of history? Or those kinds of conflicts, do those still go on, or are you finding it fairly easy to cooperate? Uh, it is still not easy to cooperate. Many tribes are protecting their own turf. I think the only time they, the tribes got together in any one unified force was by accident, and old Custer paid the price for that. <laughs> you know, just one of those things. But now what we're finding is because uh, it, it's a, a sorry note when you have to get a common enemy to come together. And when the United States is perceived as a common enemy attempting to terminate or in some way uh, defuse the existence of the reservations, then we come together. But I mean, it comes down to a life and death situation mm -hmm. before you can actually get people to say, uh, okay, if we don't do something, we're finished. Uh, I see it happening more as people start understanding the workings of our own government, the government-to-government -government relationship that Mr. Reagan talks about. As they start to understand that, we find out if we come together, then the strength's there. Mm -hmm. Still not easy. You know, it's been one of our weaknesses. Ron, something else that you did today that was so helpful and informative, you talked about from a historical perspective uh, what has happened in this country uh, between races and, and what had happened to the American Indian. And you talked about guilt, and then you referred to the idea of today, how do we deal with past history and what our responsibilities are today. And I wish you would, for our audience, talk about uh, we today being guil uh, feeling guilty about the past history and what our responsibilities are today in, in relation to guilt. Yeah, you know, and uh, this is one of the major problems and one of the major blockages we have to changing also those textbooks we were talking about. First of all, you know, uh, like, like I said, my great-grandfather, he didn't kill any white men. There were no white men here. Or my great-great-grandfather, that is. But my great-grandfather, he killed him with glee. You know, and I imagine your great-grandfather killed some Indians. But that was them, and that was then, in that point in time and space in history. We're not responsible, and I firmly believe this, no one's responsible for what happened in the generations before us. Where the responsibility comes, as I see it, is when we get to where something starts happening now, if it happens today, two days from now, it's history. But if we sit and watch it happen, and we do nothing about it, and it becomes a repeat of history, something destructive, then we're responsible. If we, have, if we sit and do not become involved, which unfortunately happens to be one of the major problems we have in this country. Yes, then from that point in time when we existed and are aware of it, we do become part of history and we become guilty. But guilt, you know, in a general sense is a bad term because it's like that nine pound rock dragging around your neck. You can't go forward and you can't advance if you're dragging this thing around with you. So my perspective is, you know, forget about that. You know learn about what the cultures are like and the people are like because I think that's rich. I think it's a, a richness that can be shared. But take the guilt and throw it away. It does no good. It's not a positive uh, effort in any way. Thank you. Janelle Berg. Following up on that, how can we preserve those parts of the culture that are most worth preserving and what do you consider those parts of the culture that you believe should be preserved? Well, I, I think there's a couple of things. First, you have to accept the fact that tribes did exist, like in this area right here, because that gives a richness to the area. The values, if there was a value. People often have a misconception about tribes and that traditional belief, and they always romanticize it. Worst thing you do is romanticize a pack of Indians. My God, don't do that, because that's, that's dangerous. And it wasn't romantic. It was a survival society that realized they moved in a cycle of life. As they moved the cycle of life, they used everything, but they didn't totally destroy it because if they did, it wouldn't be there when they came back the next year. So what they did is they balanced their existence. Uh, as I stated in the, the class series there, one of the, that 
portion has been carried forward, but it's in the form you see people out here now that are environmentalists. Well, what that is is reverse assimilation. All they're doing is grabbing on what the value of the Indian was. And the Indian always had the concept that the air, the water, the trees, the earth, everything in existence, it can all exist without man. It does not need man, but man needs it. And if they don't have it, if they allow it to be destroyed, they destroy themselves. But what that also does is put a man in a different perspective. He is no longer that great being. He's no worse than everything that exists, but he's no better. And the thing they got an edge on, we need the natural existence. It does not need us. What about artwork and some of those kinds of things, some of the kinds of things that Indians developed as a part of their style of life? Well, I think often what you'll find with uh, Indian art, and you know, it did exist, although it, they denied the existence of it because it didn't quite match with uh, the European uh, concept of art. But usually what happened as the society changed, as new items came into the society, they would create something to complement it, like the horse. Well, you know, Indians were very vain. I mean, the men were wanted to look handsome. You know, for some of us, that's really a problem. But I mean, basically, the idea was look pretty. You know, even if you're ugly as a mud fence. But the idea was to supplement any new item, and much of the artwork they created was simply decoration. Uh, the technology was there. How to create a knife using a piece of flint, piece of bone, piece of sinew that just didn't appear. It had to be developed as a technology. So. And that's art, too. It's just that it wasn't art as recognized by the European standards. We have just about a minute, Richard. One of my duties at North Idaho College is to teach a course, Native Peoples of North America. It's something I do with a great deal of enjoyment. What should I tell my students? What's really important in your mind about Indians today? If, if you were a guest in my class, and what would be a couple of key things you, you would want to tell them? One, we exist. We are here now. We're, we're valid societies uh, in a somewhat unique relationship with the United States, but also that we are using education in a positive manner to move forward and hold on at the same time of who we are, our history, and attempting to make history. I'm so sorry to interrupt with that. I must bring the pro program to a conclusion. Uh, thank you, Ron. It's been a pleasure having you here. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest has been Ron Terrio, who's the director of the Native American program at Salish Kootenai College in Montana. We hope you've enjoyed our program. Be with us again next week. Until then, have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at the same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by an NIC student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time.